I know, I'm all dressed up. There we go. Except for your chin. Except for my chin, it's got a little fuzz on it, no? No, no. Um, So I'm on a bus in Kaunas, Lithuania. We just finished a day of conference where I, I was the first speaker and we're heading off to dinner right now. So I figured I would see who would who would might might be interested in hosting again. Grace, I didn't want to uh, lean on you again, but if you'd like to, or Gil, or whoever, um, and then I will bounce and head back to to the folks here. But it's nice to see people, and I'll be home tomorrow night late. This is the last day of my trip. Well, travel, travel safely. I I can't host. I'm just sort of lurking here today. Grace, cool. are you yeah, okay hosting? I'm, uh, I'm driving, so I can't host today. I can host if yeah. nobody else. Sounds great, class. I will make you uh, the Uber Super Duper host. Let's see, I'll oh do that. <laughs> I know. Here we go. Uh, make host. Oh, uh, how about that? That worked so easily. I'm on the phone. I've never used. Um, I've never used Zoom on my phone. Thank God. <laughs> it's actually cool. working pretty well. That's right. Yeah, I did that a couple of times. And I'm I'm on I'm on the bus's Wi-Fi. So this is like an executive bus, and I'm like, ooh, free Wi-Fi, connect. Because otherwise, I'd be on Google Fi using up my minutes. And I'm like, let's try the Wi-Fi. And you guys sound perfectly clear from the set, which is fun. It's um, pretty cool. It's got You can just swipe and go into like safe mode when you're Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, so yeah, you know, and in, in Europe, we're civilized. Even the regular people's bus has Wi-Fi. It's, civil you know, <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a civil right, right? It is that. It's gotta be necessary. Um, I think today is a topic call, but it doesn't need to be. But if if y'all want to talk about what topics would be like interesting to to go for, uh, that'd be fine. Because I think last week Grace was just a check in call, right? I think so. Yeah, there's a beautiful park we're driving past. Does anyone have a suggestion for a topic? Or you could pick one of your current puzzles. Uh, Klaus, I mean, you've got lots of issues you've been putting on the list. Grace, you're, uh, I don't know if you, how much progress you've made in, the, in your open calls. If you want to talk about that, that would work. So whatever you guys want. <clears throat> I've got a weird yeah. one. I've got a very weird one. Go this, ahead. Is inspired, oh. this is inspired by Ken Homer's um, email sharing the Yoda um, lip syncing. That damn, that damn Yoda video. But I, so my question is, clearly there are trillions of extra hours that people have to devote to creative things like that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. The, the cognitive surplus. Is there any way we can just get one or two percent of it going in a direction that would change the world i totally agree now you're making me want to stay on the call but <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a great question because partly what i'm saying is you know everybody in the world doesn't doesn't contribute to wikipedia but almost everybody uses wikipedia it doesn't take a lot of people to build a huge shared asset uh, so how do we build a shared memory let's get a couple of us to contribute to the shared memory and lather rinse repeat Yep. Yeah. I'd also like to have two minutes on what uh, your conference in Bucharest left you with. What oh. were the what were the take homes, yeah. and, and also whether you've gone across the, the 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 city to go to the International Telecommunications <laughs> Union meeting. They, there's I three somehow... three thousand telecom wonks who meet every four years to determine what the UN will do to help or hinder the development of uh, the telecommunications infrastructure. Is they really need to hear from I, you, Jerry. <laughs> so Mike, Mike Nelson has my proxy. I agree with everything he's saying. Let's do whatever he right. says. <laughs> but is first, Jerry, if you could tell us about Buc <laughs> the, 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 the conference in Bucharest, yeah. the Unfinished so, Conference. So it was my third year doing something with Unfinished. They found me two years ago and invited me to do a keynote. So I recorded the keynote in Portland in some videographer's garage. And then they, you know, they showed it as a, as an, you know, one of the keynote speeches during the 2020 unfinished. But I really, I got to know them a little bit online. They were just delightful. And it's a shoestring operation <clears throat> that mixes a whole lot of art in music, painting, uh, tactile experiences, somatic stuff. I mean, it's really, really cool. Um, along with, you know, more conventional talks and, and other formats. 
And then last year I did some story threading. And then this year they're like, hey, we're going back to in-person. And they, they moved venues because this used to be held in a large art museum, which they kind of raced around in and, and took over in a cool way. But they found a University of Bucharest property <coughs> that had a big house and some grounds and a greenhouse in the back and then another little sort of cabin. And they did the most phenomenal job repurposing it. They, clean, they had to clean up the little forest. They broke up some concrete sidewalks and made like uh, gravel paths out of them. They put globes in the, you know, in the globes and fire pits with, with chairs out in the middle of the forest. And then they, we had a whole bunch of events. And I, I did a, a keynote talk that I think really went really, really well. Um, and my, my theme was basically, how did I build? So the thing I said in 2020, how did I get that thesis? And I got that thesis from paying attention to my contrarians, my outsiders. So I told that story and it worked really, really well. So I'm looking forward to that talk being available on YouTube. Um, and then I met some, like the first person I meet um, is like this Brazilian singer, songwriter, guitarist who starts running, running everybody around the campus to do a, an opening tour. Uh, then I meet two young Brazilians who are brother and sister, <clears throat> phenomenal dancer singers, wielding TikTok and Instagram like I've never seen anybody do. Like he was just scrolling through his Instas. I'm like, wait, you took all those? They're, they're incredible. And he has a stutter. He's a rapper. And when he's singing, he's on. It's insane. It's incredible. And but like when you speak with him, he's this beautiful, genuine guy. He's got a pretty heavy stutter. Um, so that, those are the first couple of people I met. And then other sorts of folks came in and the guy who does the Modern Love column for the New York Times will, every day would host some people reading some of his favorite Modern Love columns. Uh, there were exercises, there were uh, all kinds of stuff. So it was, it's a special conference. I really, I was really happy to be there. And is it related to the Unfinished Live conference that's held in New York City? So Mika Sifri wrote a piece about, the, on my advice, he wrote a piece about how Unfinished Live is trying basically to steal the brand. <clears throat> and and uh, and Christian, the founder of Unfinished Romania, uh, tried to interact with them. You know, maybe a licensing of the name or something like that. And they were assholes. Uh, so I don't really like Unfinished Live. It's uh, on my on my shit list. Thanks. Yep, yep. And if you if you Google um, Unfinished Live Mika Sifri, you'll find uh, the article. Or I can post it when I'm not on a bus moving around downtown Kanas. Any spillover from, <clears throat> from the Ukrainian uh, conflict into the discussions? So um, it's funny, in Romania, which is right next door, there were signs of support on the street, but it really didn't make it into the conference very much, although some people were like really supporting. Here, the support for Ukraine is much more visible on the streets, just everywhere. <clears throat> and then I sat down next to a woman yesterday on the bus, and I said, oh, where's home for you? And she had a kind of a Russian name. She says, Kiev. And I almost started to cry and we had a really lovely conversation. And uh, so the last slide of my deck for here was basically a homage to Ukraine and, uh, you know, Slava Ukraine kind of posters that I saw at the museum I visited on Tuesday. And you just really feel it here because the Baltics have this like, hey, we are, you know, we are a stone's throw from, <clears throat> from Russia and bad things could happen here. So, hmm. so yeah. Any other questions for Jerry? Anybody? Yeah, I'm gonna have to bounce because we're about to get off the, off the bus. Here. Is is your talk this week uh, also going to be webcast? Um, so they did not webcast. I did my talk this morning, uh, and it was not recorded or webcast. But I like it a lot, um, and I think what I'm going to do is uh, expand on it and then re-record it myself and just post it. Um, what, I, what I do in the rare cases where the conference won't record it is I wear a wire. Myself. Yeah, I was thinking of recording. I'm just using my phone in front of me and recording it. And I was like, no, nah, I won't do that. But okay. I, I better bounce. I'm going to turn over the con to, to Klaus. It's really nice to see you guys. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Well, thank thank you. you Thanks, for everybody. Getting us going. This is awesome. Thank you. I... All right. <laughs> well, so any, any suggestions for topic? <clears throat> Um, one of the topics I've been thinking about a lot, which I think a little bit connects to what um, Mike was saying, was what would what would the attributes of a better social media platform look like? I was talking to somebody who's doing, uh, a, 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 I mean, I've been talking to a lot of people doing that, and I was saying, 
if I were creating a group like this community and I wanted a better platform, you know, what would be some of the things? Like one of the things might be um, if somebody posts something a little bit nasty, it gives them time to regret. You know, like, are you sure maybe you want to have your coffee a little bit before you post that thing? You know, something like that. Like, what would be the attributes of a better social network? And I think it does connect to the topic of how do we get everybody to use a little bit of their spare time to make um, the world a better place? I feel like there's a connection there. Okay. I think there's totally a connection. Uh, uh, The reason I only join about half of these calls is because at 11 o'clock on Thursday, every other Thursday, I have a net for neighbors call. And it's a little bit broader than your question, but most of it is about how do you design the internet and particularly social media so that I can organize the people in my neighborhood to do something in the real world it seems to be very hard to do that. I can I can organize 15 people to play a video game in 17 countries, but just reaching out to the uh, you know 400 people that live within 500 meters of me and cleaning up the park on Saturday morning, it's very hard to do that. And part of it is because there's no trust. Part of it is because different demographics are on different things. And part of it is because there are people that just don't want to use these these tools at all. So it, it, I, I love your question. I love your question, and and I wish the people at Facebook and and uh, and Twitter were paying more attention to that question of how do you build community, how do you get people to come back to the platform if they've left, or how do you build trust? I mean, all that. Yeah, that's a good one because I'm I'm actually also in that same uh, uh, puzzle trying to connect in my local community and get people engaged and it's uh yeah it's it's a it's a challenge um why don't we why don't we pick that up and and go around doc do you want to start um I've spent a lot of time thinking about this (laughs) Um, and spent two hours this morning in a working session with my partner in Argentina talking about um, creating a a persistent, um, open to synchronicity um, cafe or salon um and the the holy grail for me that i've been trying to arrive at and achieve with another human being in a zoom c- container is a space where um i don't know how many of you are familiar with the chakra system mm-hmm. um but that The sort of ticket for entry is that you're coming in um, with a sort of consciousness awareness of the throat chakra, which is the first of the three intangible higher chakras that have to do with transcendence of I, transcendence of ego, transcendence of self. Because so much of social platform engagements never seem to be able to get out of either competitive show and tell um, or um, sort of falling into woo-woo without it being possible to combine that with doing, with creating, generating new. So it's sort of like people can do one or the other, but they can't seem to do an integrated version of both. <laughs> so that that's the living piece for me, like hell or high water, and maybe I won't make it before I'm gone, but um, that I'm like looking to um, experience <laughs> with, the, with others. Um, so that that's the piece of the puzzle in this 
you know, meme that, that lives for me. Okay. Carl, you have your hand up, but then you're up next anyways. You want to go ahead? Okay. Yeah, this is at the heart of all the things I've been working at, too. It's, uh, um, it's interesting. I was saying just as I got on to with Sherry that there's like all this convergence around can people with disabilities participate in the virtual world uh, type of thing. I mean, that's might be the greatest challenge we've had technically tech, technology wise and as far as like the people side of things. So yeah, there's um there's a future of text group and I'd actually written a paper last year for um that kind of said that it's, it's a text-based interface that's required for for um, people with disabilities to participate in real time and things. So I'm gonna update that paper as part of one of the projects, but yeah, it gets to, um, yeah. And then, um, well, Howard Rheingold, uh, kind of one of the ones who kind of coined virtual world and virtual community and stuff. And he talked about Doug Engelbart's vision as being intelligence augmentation instead of the art instead of artificial intelligence and Ben Snyderman wrote a book that got published back in February on human-centered artificial intelligence and he frames it as a second Copernican revolution we need the algorithms need to be <laughs> revolving around people rather than <laughs> and stuff so those are two of my those are kind of two of my sources and stuff but it gets uh, it gets to this whole thing too i mean and it's the technology is really i mean the communications technology i mean with what we've had within the past couple decades i mean everybody in the everybody in the world can be can be talking to anybody else in the world in real time and stuff through you know technologies like we're using right now and stuff and that what that enables so much stuff i mean we've had in the last hundred years, we probably had uh, like four epochal shifts in communication technology. So it's it's just a, it's such upheaval. I mean, that's what the authoritarians are able to to take. I mean, it's like it's easy to have propaganda about how great the world was when you were a child and stuff, but trying to convince people that we can that we can really create a better world is is tough <laughs> so it's kind of i'll leave it there for now carl there, there, are, <clears throat> there are two aspects here really one is the uh media platform and which has opened up uh, incredible uh opportunities to communicate across the time and space i mean vast spectrums but then there's also what you're going to talk about and and, and so so the, the structure of the conversation, the topic of the conversation. How do you how do you see that? Yeah, that's the um, yeah that um, another one of uh, Doug Engelbart's concepts is about co-evolving human and tool systems. So we've the technology, <laughs> the tool systems we've been involving amazingly we're devolved our human systems seem to be devolving right now but it's yeah it's how do you um a big key for me is uh, i've been uh, is uh, facilitation methods too so how do you engage people and um so there is yeah it's there's like this whole like enabling environment that we need and then then we and the the then these facilitation methods can can um, leverage that to really get people communicating more eff effectively and stuff. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just having a conversation with Judy, who so doesn't have uh, doesn't have sound. I think Gil, could you go next, please? Sure, Mike's got his hand up. Maybe that's a correct comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Uh, it's not a direct comment, but um, it, it it is about this problem of the bad squeezing out the good, 
And I've just seen so many discussion lists degenerate because one or two people decide they have an opinion and if everybody doesn't share it, they're gonna keep stating their opinion. <laughs> and I, I, I think Reddit has been amazing in terms of you know pushing up the good and pushing down the bad, but we don't have that for most of the platforms we use online. And, and, and clearly the Facebook algorithm is almost exactly the opposite. If someone says something disgusting, revolting, provocative, quote, provocative, that gets pumped up even if it, even if it wastes everyone's time but well that's by design that's their intention exactly You're exactly what they're designed to do yeah but, but i don't know that the nonprofit social platforms have found a better algorithm that or they found a better algorithm but they haven't found the best algorithm so that's the, that's the challenge for some of these other other people out there well, the uploading downloading is an interesting thing. The problem isn't just the algorithm of the platform, but how the platform gets meaning to scale. Yeah. <clears throat> which, which is not the internet of the media. So I want to come back to Mike's, with your suggestion about how do we uh, do something with the cognitive surplus. Um, I personally don't feel a lot of cognitive surplus. You mentioned Reddit, and I remember like all the platforms I'm supposed to be tracking that I don't track. Uh, so there's that. But um, the notion's intriguing, and I really miss Ken Homer in this conversation. Yeah. Um, the reason will become clear in a moment. I, I, as I start to think into what you're suggesting, I think of sort of three layers immediately. One is, is, is SETI, which is using you know, cognitive surplus of computing power, but that's not a constraint anymore. No. Uh, so that's not, that's not the issue. Um, the second is, um, you know, is, 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 is the kind of mobilization strategies. Uh, you know, both direct and 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 um, um, network generating action, getting people to vote or getting neighbors to do something like you're talking about. <clears throat> um, and you know, you have platforms like uh, we don't have time out of Europe, which is not well known in the United States, but it's got millions of people who are climate action. Um, hmm. um, and the third layer is is what we're doing here, which is human beings having conversations that move something forward in the world. And that's what intrigues me and is why I would want Ken in the conversation. He's kind of a, you know, he's a wizard of that sort of thing. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not like we need cognitive surplus to figure out what to do. We need cognitive surplus to get us engaged with each other, um, you know, living in the world differently, interpreting the world differently, having different moods about the shit show that's around us, uh, and generating effective local and national and international actions. So that's sort of like my, uh, that's what's immediately provoked by what you're saying. It's obviously kind of superficial, but the, 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 the provocation that you're offering of what might happen if 1% of the trillions of apps going into bullshit media stuff uh, got shifted into something else. And I'm content to start with nothing more specific than that and just go wild with that both in this group. And that might be a place to start out in the world. It's like, you know, take your provocation and put it out wide and, in, and have some kind of structure to harvest whatever it generates uh, and just let that loose as a wild virus in the world. Like what might happen if, you know, if, I mean, if each of you took two minutes off from TikTok or MSNBC or whatever your drug of choice is, and that's not very much, but um, what if like, you know, 5 million of us did that? What might be possible? My friend, David Gershon, who um, runs the Empowerment Project, um, out of where? Out of Woodstock, New York, which has done the cool block program around, around the country, getting neighbors to work together around environmental and sustainability improvement. It's like the old barn raising. It's let, let's all of us work on water heaters this month. All of us work on gardens next month. It's a very cool program. And David's great line is that, you know, people say, whatever I do feels like a drop in the bucket. And we all know that. And he says, but what if I could show you the bucket? Mm -hmm. And what if you could see all the little drops starting to fill something up? And that's what I, that's how I listen, Mike, to what you're saying here. I love it. Um, and uh, let's, let's do something. I should get him to come to my call for, you know, the session of brainstorming. Um, send, send me a note and I'll make the introduction. Thank you very much. Of course. That's it for me.
Klaus can't hear you. You're muted. That's a Wookiee mistake. It's a, Grace, it's you, a firing yeah. offense for a host. <laughs> Grace, you got your hand up. Grace, can you can yeah, you hear us? Sorry. Yeah, I just okay. have um I got one of those glass covers for my phone and now I have to press really hard when I want to unmute. Um, <laughs> so um yeah, so it's interesting because I don't think two minutes is gonna is gonna kind of cut it, but I love what you were saying about the bucket, and I think that like the que the question is really interesting, right? Like, what you know, what if we could get people to you know take some time out and actually do something positive, and get them to feel that they had done something positive? Because maybe two minutes is enough to get you to do four minutes next week, you know? Maybe that's that's good enough for now. Hold on, I'm just gonna stop so you can see. Um, anyway, so that that's a great start. And I think one of the things that I keep thinking about whenever I think about this question, like what would better mean, is like is is exactly that. What what do I mean by the purpose? And I think maybe there's no one size fits all. So one thing might be, okay, how do we design social media that gets people to at least speak to someone in person once a week, right? Go, go to an event and, and meet somebody because there's a need that we have that this kind of, you know, when we talk about Zoom fatigue, what we're talking about is it feels weird to be in these relationships online without actually talking to somebody and the loneliness, kind of endemic loneliness that we have. So one purpose might be let's, yeah, meet up without meet up, right? And Another purpose might be one of the things that I think so much about in groups and in communities is um, in 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 uh, businesses called churn, right? What happens when somebody leaves? I mean, how many times have you either left a group or somebody in your group has left and nobody said anything? Um, mm. But your cable company knows when you're about to leave. Your cable company has all kinds of statistics and about when they start to see certain usage patterns, they call you up and offer you a deal because they know you're going to leave. They've even anticipated that you're leaving based on your usage patterns and other usage patterns. And that would be easy in a social network. If you were in a group like this and people stopped coming to the meeting, well, that's obvious. Or if somebody used to post a lot and they post less or whatever there might be even certain posts that you know if certain words are used that person who got spoken to that way might leave and how could you how could you create more um, groups that stay together longer hmm. or care about people when they leave that's one of the things that I think a lot about because when I think about a part of it's because I'm in the it feels intrusive yeah well social media is intrusive but but <laughs> But uh, but it's not just intrusive. I mean, when you're in a group and you say I'm going to quit and or I'm upset and nobody does anything about it, it feels like shit. And when you leave and nobody calls you, it feels like shit. And that's how I would say, God, I don't even want to say what percentage, but it's something like very close to 100 percent of the groups that I belong to are. Is, is if you leave, nobody says anything. And I work in the crypto world where, you know, fork is like, well, if you don't like it, fork it or rage quit or, and, 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 and I think that's a really, when we're talking about social cohesion, I think that's an extremely, maybe you don't want to anticipate it. Maybe that is intrusive, but I do think good social media is in some way, any AI you're talking about is in some way intrusive. Show me the things that are happening near me or um, the things that I might be able to have impact on or the things where I'm an expert on them and I could contribute. All of that has to be by definition in order to be useful in some ways, it has to be a little bit intrusive or maybe very intrusive. Um, just knowing what my favorite movies and music are, right? So that, that can be, you know, sometimes you go to somebody's house and the first thing you're doing is looking at their bookshelf to see what kind of, you know, it's intrusive. <laughs> so, so anyway, but I think that there is, so I think it's really about that. So I keep, I think about, I think about these things as in how to get people more, like what are you measuring in terms of more related, more cohesion, 
longer relationships, more meaningful relationships, physical relationships. Like that's that's kind of what I'm I'm thinking about because um, we're so lonely. The uh, UK now has a junior minister for loneliness, which I think is just brilliant and and badly needed. I don't know if they've accomplished anything, um, but it's certainly a, a, a topic we need to need to explore. Um, your your idea about keeping people together reminds me of the cohesion committee that we established here at Carnegie about uh, five months ago. Um, we're bringing people back into the office and trying to give them a reason to come to the office. A lot of us are knowledge workers and we often work away on our papers, don't always reach out and talk to people. I'm, I'm an extrovert, extrovert so I, I, I can't imagine not talking to people constantly. But in order to create more cohesion, we've been trying to do things that would help. And I'm sort of in charge of using LinkedIn as a platform to build little groups that Carnegie people could subscribe to and they could, you know, maybe there's a sports group and maybe there's a culture group and maybe there's a research methods group. And, but, it, but I, I haven't found a lot of good examples. And again, it comes back to the point someone made earlier. I'm supposed to be following 50 different conversations every day. And how in the hell do I do that? But uh, yeah, cohesion is is sorely lacking, and and even in our neighborhood, I, uh, just to share a personal story, the couple who moved in four and a half years ago in our townhouse complex is moving out. And she, they sent an email saying, you know, hey, we bought a house, and I I kind of counted up how many times we actually got together with them in four and a half years, and it was it was probably six times. And you know they're they've been busy. They've had a child, and all, but it's it's just it's so easy not to reach out and to just say, well, if they have time, they'll reach out to me. Uh, it doesn't work if they're both if both sides are saying the same thing to themselves, and and we all are overcommitted. But it just sometimes we just have to somehow welcome the community into our lives and see who returns the email. You know, I wonder what role these associations play um, who have before internet traditionally filled uh, the the community sense. I mean, League of Women Voters comes to mind, but there is, I mean, dozens of, uh, of special interest uh, groups, you know, that uh, perpetuate themselves somehow. And, and a lot of them aren't perpetuating themselves. A lot of them are collapsing. A lot of bowl, bowling leagues to Elks clubs to, I mean, the veterans groups will carry on forever, but there's a whole lot of these communities that have just faded away. Yeah. And COVID certainly threw a curveball into all this. Yeah. Yeah. Stacy, you are, you are next. I don't even know where to start. Um, <clears throat> I've often said, <clears throat> I've often wondered what about if we look to solve for loneliness, how would all the other problems be solved? Because I really think that's that's the starting point. Um, I used to work, I used to serve on the board of the temple and I was on the welcoming committee. And that was really the turnaround of where we had a new rabbi and that's where our temple really started to be, where people would say we became a family. Um, you know, the idea of trust was mentioned before and I've had this conversation with a few people. It's very hard to build trust when the truth is most people come into these spaces with an agenda, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, they do. Now, some people don't. Um, I've left a lot of different groups, but I've always left with friends that I keep with me. Um, and those are the ones you trust. And I've met a lot of them in person and I will hopefully continue to have them. Um, I'll jump that, I'll jump to where Grace started with the social media because this week alone, I must have removed three comments within a few seconds of writing them. And one time it was because I was like, oh, do I really need to say that? You know, it was just a matter of self-reflection. 
Is it a rhetorical question? Do I need to say it? Is it going to further, you know, or, or am I saying it for attention? Whatever it was, it was about self-reflection, which the majority, you know, I mean, people in this group probably do a lot of that, but your average person on Facebook doesn't. So having a question pop up, like, is that rhetorical? Do you want an answer? Are you being sarcastic? Who knows, that might help. Um, the other time I was trying to make a correction because I could see it going in a bad direction. So I left it up for a few minutes, long enough for the person who posted to see it, and then I took it down. Um, what else did I wanna say? Oh, as far as engagement, it seems that we keep trying to think of how we could get other people engaged. But I think if we focused on what can we be doing that we're enjoying? You know, Mike talked about, um, I didn't see that Kent, the video that Ken Homer posted, but whatever was posted, the person that made it was having fun making it. So, I mean, obviously we enjoy coming to these calls because we come. None of us are coming here because we're like, oh, it's Thursday, I have to come to this call. If this wasn't enjoyable, we would not be here. So my feeling is, let's start from what we're enjoying, working together and see what grows out that way, as opposed to projecting out there and figuring out how to get people to do the stuff out there. And with that, I'm complete. <laughs> Stacy, what platforms are you using the most? I see you on Facebook and- I only use Facebook. I only use, I just can't. People send me TikTok, I just can't. Facebook is enough. And I like it better that way because I get a full picture of somebody on Facebook. I see how their friends relate to that. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on there anymore, but when something does come up, I can see how they relate with people they actually know. With, I could just, you get to see them in a lot of situations, whereas you don't have that full picture on the other platforms. You just see like a slice. Okay. So, you know, no, uh, um, what are, what are the, the other social media platforms here? Instagram. Instagram and uh, TikTok. Yeah. None nope. of them. <laughs> Did you see any changes in Facebook over the last year or so? Uh, any any difference in the way they they uh, are, are structuring themselves? Well, I can tell you for me personally, I don't even get to see friends anymore. I'm just getting group, you know, like suggestions. I'm just getting groups coming to me, ads get. I sometimes I have to go to somebody's page. I'm like, have they been posting? You know, I don't get friends. It, you know, when I first went on Facebook, it was because, you know, my friends were putting up pictures, you know, of parties or, you know, our kids were all being bar mitzvahed. I wanted to see them. It was a way to keep in touch. I don't see that at all. You know, I, yeah, I feel isolated. <laughs> ah, Gail, you have your hand up. Yeah, a um, couple of reactions to what Stacy said. Thank you for that, Stacy. Um, so disclosure, I'm I'm active on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I try to do more on LinkedIn professionally. I've tried to control Facebook, um, which is just a weird damn place. Um, I only friend people who I actually know in meet space. That's my particular quirk there. Um, and I've learned um, painfully to not comment on comments from people that I don't know. So there's a couple of times where fr you know, friends of uh, friends have said something and I've said something just like on it shit show, so I don't do that anymore. Um, I've uh, looked at Instagram, but I'm not really on it. I've never touched um, uh, TikTok. And uh, you know, Reddit is random and Signal is random. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, you know, it seems that we need different cultural norms. I mean, we have cultural norms about how you behave when you meet somebody at the market or how you behave when you visit them at their home. 
or in your faith community, or maybe in your community organization, although that's deteriorating clearly. Um, we see that on the news. Uh, we don't have norms for this online stuff. Um, so we're using you know, habits that have evolved in other places um, to, um, you know, to yell at each other here. It's kind of weird. Um, Grace, to your comment about people who come in with an agenda, I, I hear you. And another way to think about that is people who are coming in with cares. You mean Stacy? I'm Stacy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Stacy. Yeah. I, I, my screen got covered. I didn't see you. There you are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is you know, um, what if we think about people as coming in with cares rather than agendas? How do we engage with that and understand what they care about? There's been a lot of work on the power of of, of deep listening uh, and learning to listen not to what people are saying, but what it is that's behind what they're saying as a way to open a different kind of door. This is another reason why I wish Ken were here. He's all over this stuff, um, as is you know Fernando Flores and um, what's her name and Wheatley and a number of people who have been real real students and teachers in this realm about how to how to discover a conversation that's not obviously there and get past the obvious to a point that where people can actually connect. So like you know Mike, your neighborhood stuff is like that. You know, there's a level at which. Um, you know, if it's cleaning up, if it's cleaning up the vacant yard a block away, that has nothing to do with your politics, religion, or anything else. It's like an obvious care, you know, common common care in the neighborhood. And it's a way to build a connection that maybe opens up into other kinds of conversations. So that's can it. Can I, Doug, can I just respond to that? Because I sense like most people, the word agenda kind of felt icky in some way. Like, but I want I want to speak to that because. I think it's important that we, whether you call it a care or an agenda, the point is if you feel that somebody is coming to you because even if it means they, you know, they like you, there's still a conditionality there. You know, it's still like, there's still inside. It's like, well, if I don't say what they like, <clears throat> they're going to think differently about me. And so I think it's important to acknowledge it. So you can use any word you want, but the truth is you, you really can't build trust that way. And that's what I want to put out there. Jill, you still have your hand up. Did you want to go? Um, oh, that's just floating up there. I'll take it down. Okay. There, there is this strange mix between... Um, uh, anonymity, you know, no matter how you're on the net, and then uh, uh, evolving familiarity and friendship and so on. So because it's just not a physical relationship. Yeah. Doc, go ahead. Yeah, so um, so I spent, I've spent like the last six years up until about six months ago um 35 hours a week in zoom long before mm -hmm. covid hit um and i related to it as sort of the the counterpart to my my uh, collaborator in argentina he was pursuing the academic phd track i was doing the field work and it was um a lot you know half of that was focused on gatherings that were topic and agenda blank slate just coming together to, to talk, to connect. And the favorite of all of them was actually uh, a guy in Enlivening Edge, which was George Poor's uh, teal stake in the ground in the wake of um, uh, Lelou's book. Um, but this guy just said, you know, I really like meeting people and talking to people. So I'm going to do these regular things every first and third Thursday of the month. And they were called community conversations. And what I loved about them was they were agenda-less. They were subject-less. They were um, not in service to purpose or producing or doing anything. It was just in service to meeting and connecting. And um, I ended up sort of in stewardship of the third Thursday. He he took the first Thursday, and that 
became sort of a storyteller place where people would come in and share. Um, and then that would be the, the launching pad for people to go into breakout rooms and, and share takes and feelings and reactions and then bring them together in larger sessions where they'd be shared. Um, I ended up with third Thursdays and um, I would pick a meme, a word, um, and come up with a couple of questions, one internally introspectively oriented and one extrovertedly oriented um, to explore my own particular twist and dimension of how I related to that word as a as a um, orientation point. And but the the underlying intrinsic sort of knowing and value that evolved was a practice that I ended up calling emergent conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it, in the experience of it, it doesn't feel like there's any constraint, doesn't feel like there's any framework, doesn't feel like there's any elaborate anything, but there's actually art in that. Creating a safe container, not bringing or imposing anything, not having any quid pro quos, not having any prerequisites. But um, so part of that was in the, the design of the invitation itself, like the announcement of the event, the framing of that. And part of it was in a couple of steps at the front end that um, the first one had to do with people hearing their own voices, speaking to others in breakout rooms, like just the act of having everybody responding to each other, and usually in groups of no more than two to three people, brief, but everybody coming out of that was like present. <laughs> like might seem really basic, but like it's a deal. It's a big deal for people to actually um, be in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the the fundamentals of connection, for some, it's about like being invited and feeling safe to express themselves, to use their voice, their agency. Um, and, and for others, it's um, being heard, like really, truly feeling heard. And then there being the space and the time for people to um, acknowledge and enhance that by saying, yo, I hurt you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they're really fundamental, basic human experiential things that are missing in a lot of what's going on out there, but that are achievable in a Zoom context. Like it, it, it can get really intimate, as in into me see, you know, that kind of intimacy. Um, and it can be very powerful and connections can be very strong and I have partners and people that um, around the world I've never physically shared space with uh, that I'm very, very, very close to and vice versa. Um, so it's in the soft human spaces um, where the magic and the energy is and the connection is. Uh, and that sort of is, is as, as Jose Leo loves to invoke, that's proto, not meta. Mm -hmm. It's like fundamental and before you get to talking about something. And uh, it is amazing if you create the invitation, the space, the safety, and the just enough of a frame for people to either feel comfortable about how to or feel safe enough to. Um, uh, have that opportunity. 
And that can be stirred into any existing context, corporate or political or whatever. Um, but there are dimensions that most people don't attach a, a thing to, don't relate to as something necessary. They, go, they ju jump to chapter four and get busy. Um, so I just wanted to offer that. Mike, go ahead. Doug, I, I guess I wasn't listening quite carefully enough and wasn't taking notes fast enough. What was the name of the, of the person who instigated these communities and, and, and what was the the umbrella term? I, it was a living edge? Oh, in, in, enlivening edge. It enlivening was George, George, edge. George Poor's uh, magazine, Stake in the Ground Community for uh, the Teal Global Teal Movement. Okay. But, but the community conversations were not teal centered. They were just want to get together and meet each other and talk. And poor was spelled P O R with the the dots over the O. Although I've never invoked the dots. Okay. But George is a movement guy. Got it. I, I love what you had to say, and I, I I wish we could make this group the board or at least the board of advisors for some new social media platform that a billionaire other than Elon Musk would fund. <laughs> um, but I thought your, your three-part mission statement there, you know, create a space where people are present, where they feel heard and where they feel safe. I mean, that's sort of what we need. <laughs> so, <laughs> why, why hasn't the market given us this? Thank you very much. I thought those remarks were amazing. Thanks for the clarification. Jill, you have to, you're next. Yeah, Doug, thanks for that. It was beautiful. And uh, I love the proto versus meta distinction. Very rich. Uh, I'm finding in, in many of the regular groups that I'm in, I was just running a count in my head. I think there's six extended Zoom conversations that I'm in on a regular basis. Some some of them weekly, some of them bi-weekly, some in hours, some in two hours. Um, <clears throat> many of them um, have been moving toward more time in breakout groups. Uh, some started with brief breakouts uh, in my Living Between Worlds Co, which Ken's been co-hosting with me the last couple of months. We're doing a kind of world, mini world cafe where we do an introductory in plenary. We used to have a lot of discussion in plenary. We've gone to just not doing that, going into um, you know breakout with a question, breakout with a second question, and then back for a harvest. And the feedback's been very, people said, this is why I'm here. Fin finally, this is why I'm here. They've been hanging out for a long time, but this they say, I want that. Um, some of the groups are pretty much all breakout. Some are very little, uh, but it's an attempt to get at that, you know, at, at the qualities of, um, of, um, of, of presence and being heard, feeling heard and feeling safe. And we've noticed that a number of people are starting to establish direct one-on-one -on -one relationships with each other out of that. So I'll just offer that into the mix. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Chris, yeah, you have your hand up. And you're muted. Yeah, so this thing about, like, we talk a lot about being safe and, and I've thought of, about and, and there's and we're talking a little bit about online versus in the real world right we want people to do something in the real world and there's always a risk I, I you know like I, there's a couple examples in my life but you know one of the obvious ones is if I work in these extremely male dominated industries how come I can never get a date and it's like well I'm not going to take a risk in those environments when I'm face to face with people or going to a, a industry event, like I'm not gonna get drunk at a party in my industry. It's just not gonna happen because there's a risk, right? And it's not just about like safe, right? It's about risk. And then um, another example from my life is I went, I got a haircut at this place and it wasn't very good. And I, I same with my uh, glasses. I got my glasses at this place and they were like, okay. And um, the um, and then I I had to write a review on Google. I was like, I'm not writing a bad review. Those people live two kilometers down the street from me. 
right? I actually know them in real life. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and so there's a risk. And, and then the third example I want to give is we've all been in business relationships or personal relationships. And if you're perceptive, you've noticed, you don't really know that you can trust that person until something really went wrong and you fixed it together, right? Until you have that breakdown and that misunderstanding and you saw each other's ugly, it's like, I'm not sure I can do business with this person or I'm not sure this person's my friend. And so I think being unsafe is a really important part of relationships that we're pretending isn't there. It's like, oh, if everybody felt safe all the time, well, if everybody felt safe all the time, I wouldn't know if, I, if they're just like kind of being phony. And it's so much easier to be safe in this environment where, um, where it's like, I'm not, at, I'm not at risk. Like all of you guys um, live on the other side of the ocean. My chances of actually meeting you in real life is really low. So I can say whatever the heck, I, you know, right? There's, I think risk is a really important part of relationship and, and it's an important, and it's, it really touched me um, when uh, Mike was at the beginning talking about getting the neighbors actually physically together, because as long as you don't, like when you go to pick up stuff, right? How do you dress? If we're gonna go do a garbage pick, how do I dress for the first time you see me? And how much garbage are you gonna expect me to pick up? And what about that gross thing I don't wanna touch? And you know, all of a sudden there's gonna be all these, um, behaviors that aren't expected of me and then Stacy was talking about synagogue when you go to synagogue it's this um you know what's going to happen they're like and the welcoming committee if you go to a good synagogue and the first time you walk in they they offer you an aliyah and either you know how to do that or you don't and if you know how to do it you're like okay I know exactly the words I'm going to say I know exactly the melody I'm going to say it I know what's expected of me and it's and and I'm not going to get the first one, so I'm going to get to see the other people who go before me. And there's no no you know like it's a very small risk at the beginning. And there's certain behaviors of how you sit and how you act. And I feel like in the neighborhoods, there's like a there's all this risk that you don't like oh. So so I feel like we need to both mitigate that and also create that in a way that works. I don't I don't know how to do that but it's not all about safe it's about unsafe too thanks chris uh, i switched gene and mike because mike you have to hop out in a moment do you want to go next mike i just wanted to say thank you for an incredibly fruitful conversation we for me it was three hours of wisdom in one hour and i'm really upset i have to drop off but i'll hope to see you uh in the future conversations all right. Thanks, and I, I hope we can capture some of this for the people who weren't here. I'm, I'm sure Ken would love to know what uh, what came down. The, the chat has about 5% of it. Yeah, it's being recorded. Okay, that's right. We'll, we'll, do the we'll do the clockwork orange thing and strap Ken to a chair and prop his eyelids up and make him watch the record. <laughs> and make that's him right. type responses <laughs> to everything we say. <laughs> Okay, Gene, you want to you want to go next? Thank you, Mike. Do you want to go next, Gene? I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> so, okay, um, Grace, you want to restate it? Uh, the question is: social media uh, platform. How do we interact? How do we engage? How can we create community? Um, does that uh, summarize it? Sounds like several questions. It was something like, what do we mean by better? And what would that look like when we say we want a better social media platform? Well, even before that, Mike had raised the question of what might we do with the massive cognitive surplus of all these gazillions of people spending all these gazillions of hours on various kinds of social media platforms. So it's more agnostic than the platform and what do we do with that. that. That's what I heard before than, than the question that you mentioned before. I would say take a risk and comment whatever you want to. <laughs> You're safe. With all that said, Shane, what do you make for what do you make of it? For all of those people who spend all of that time on social media, I expect that there aren't many of them who have a gun to their head forcing them to do that, right? 
so that apparently they find it meaningful for one reason or another. And, and what is it? What is it that encourages you to engage with someone else? What is what is what is it that's actually the basis for community? You, you talked about, you know, I mean, who knows how many groups there are on LinkedIn these days, and and they're constantly trying to get other people to join. Though I find that the best thing that I can do is to figure out how to make the exchange I have with someone meaningful to them. Right? Screw what I want, you know? I mean, I can find it someplace. Um, if, if I, well, I could talk to you once and never talk to you again, so then who gives a shit, right? But if, if I actually wanted to have more than one conversation with you, then I have to begin to understand what you care about. You know, and I hear, hear these people say, well, they don't care. Well, the only people I've ever met that didn't care were dead people. So you, I don't know. I have it all figured out. <laughs> Yeah. I, well, I haven't I really answered like, the question, have I? No, no, you have done great. I mean, I really like uh, your perspective of making the conversation important to the person you're conversing with. Now, I think that's a really key insight here. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do uh, as, a, uh, <laughs> as a moderator or in, in, in any form of conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we are, I mean, we obviously, you know, everyone has an agenda and, um, and you're biasing your conversation with your agenda, no question. So to switch that perspective and look at the other person uh, instead of, of uh, your own interest, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good one. So it's still uh, an agenda, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then Gil is saying it's not that hard at all. This is all relative, Gil. <laughs> yeah. uh, Stacy, you have your hand up. Yeah, Jean just you know showed showed me something about myself because I think that's why I do engage on Facebook. What I try to do is I respond to people in a way so that they feel heard. I think that's mostly, you know, I mean, I'm there for other reasons too. But usually when I get into a conversation in a private group, it's somebody sort of asking for advice or something like that. So it's twofold. I'm trying to make them feel heard, but it's serving me because I feel valuable that I'm providing something. So I'm getting something that I feel like I'm serving in some way, but I'm doing something positive because they're feeling heard. So we're both connecting, we're both getting something. So. Thanks, Jean. I have the words now to say what I'm doing with my time. <laughs> Jean, you have your hand up. To what extent might we actually be aware of how often we are seeking validation? I like questions better than statements. Well, that was a statement, wasn't it? <laughs> Anybody want to touch that? No. <laughs> Can you restate that again? A state, well, a statement that ends with a question mark. <laughs> the, considering the amount of time that we actually, actually are seeking validation, and that is our agenda. Are we aware of that? Well, that's why I took, like I said earlier, how three times I removed a comment because I had to ask myself, is that the reason I'm commenting? So I think that if we're introspective, then we're constantly saying, well, why am I doing this? 
But no, I don't think most people are aware that they're seeking validation. And I think that's why it's so important that we know who we are and what we what we want. Like I, most of the time I'm doing the things that I wanna do because I really like it. So if I'm trying to make somebody feel heard, it's not because, I mean, I'm enjoying it. I like it too. So it's a win-win. Yeah. Is is there actually anything, is there, blah, blah. is there really anything that's truly altruism? Are you shaking your head because you're saying yes or no? I'm saying yes. Absolutely, yes. There's not a lot of it in evidence in altruistic world of today, but there is a, at least a conceptual, you know, pure right. altruism, pure altruism, giving in service to, um, without, you know, as a one way, um, no strings, no load, no attachments uh, out of, out of, a pure altruistic driver. Yeah, and, I, be I believe and, that exists. And how would you think that person would feel if they didn't do that? Um, it's a great question, actually. Uh, for me, um, not good. So you I are receiving something. No, I'm not. Re well, receiving yeah. something, receiving something. No, it's not. It's not a. Um, it's not a thing. So, am I deriving? Uh, you know, a, a feeling and sense of well-being, and. Um, and fulfillment of value in the world, like contributing something to the world. Yeah, absolutely. But it's not a, the reason I'm, I'm sort of picking you up on the thing thing is because it's a felt sensed lived uh, dynamic for me, not a return in a transactional frame. I think we, that- We could have a great conversation about that, Doug. We'd love yeah, to do that. <laughs> we have. So Carl has his hand up. Uh, do you want to go next, Carl? Okay. Yeah. My um, my first master's degree in organizational learning. Uh, we had a class uh, self as consultant, and it was all about like you really can't be an effective consultant unless you're really aware of yourself in the moment, uh, type of thing, and it. It was funny because I had, there was like one glimpse of that I had with it. And then it's like, I made contact, eye contact with my um, professor. And I realized she had that self-awareness of every person in the room. It was, it was like that um, Kasparov, I think he, like the national high school chess championships. He played every, a hundred, they had the top three from every state, 150 simultaneous games. 149-0-1. He had 15 seconds to make a move. They had like the time it took him to go around the gym. 149-0-1. So yeah, as I said, or it's like that mastery of it, but it's how can we really be, you know, self self-aware in the moment and um to I mean to see there's I mean there's with trust, I mean there's authenticity. Um that Carl Eric Swipe um, talks about um, trust is the bandwidth of human communication. That's one of my one of my favorite quotes. Mm. <laughs> but, thank yeah, I'll, thank I'll you. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. It's hard to. Yeah, thank you. I love that. Jill, you're next. Yeah, Gina, I like your questions. Uh, I'm I'm. <clears throat> I, I, I fall in line with Doug mostly on this. I think that I, I, in my experience, there is altruism. And uh, yeah, it can be transactional altruism, which is sort of a weird kind of altruism. But it's not like I'm getting something from somebody else. It's I'm generating a sense of myself 
when I act consistent with my sense of myself and what I care about. So am I still, am I getting something you could say that, but it's not that I'm getting something from outside of me. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think, you know, I think altruism is rampant. I think it's one of the characteristics of human beings. I mean, why in the world would strangers run into burning buildings to rescue people they don't know? It's not just to get on the front page of the newspapers these that long before they were front pages of newspapers. Hmm. So I, I have to run. I'm late for another meeting, but it's been meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Mark. You're muted. We can't hear you. Not muted in Zoom, but we can't hear you. <laughs> well, let you figure this out, Chris. Do you want to go next? Then we'll come back to Mark. I think you can you hear are me. On. Okay, yeah. yeah All right. right. Um, I have a number of friends who look at relationships as, in the metaphor of the economy, there's you know, plus, there's minus, there's um, investing in people, there's um, kind of billing people for, for you know, your time in, in some way. Um, again, kind of exchange model, transactional model. And that is something that does exist, but I don't think it is mandatory. I don't think it's you know, I don't think everybody models human relationships in, in economic terms. And it always disturbs me, especially when it comes to friendship, loving, romance, um, the, the more sort of human as opposed to kind of more kind of social or societal um, models. Anyway, um, I see a couple people um, nodding their heads or a couple people looking confused. <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass to, uh, I don't know if Gil is, uh, still has his hand up or Grace. Yeah, I think maybe Grace next. I think, uh, Grace, you go ahead. You're well, muted. Well, waiting for Grace, I'll just say, yeah, Gene's questions really threw me and his his point of view. I'm kind of really interested in finding out more and understanding him more. Hi, sorry. As I moved from the mobile network to my home network, my phone went all kind of weird. I think these questions, I mean, there's just like an underlying something in these questions that I, I, I want to stand back from. One is like altruism, right? Altruism would imply that there's some separation between you and me, like that my good and your good are somehow separate. And given that we live on a, the same planet, that's probably not very true. And so even the phraseology altruism to me is a little bit like it implies something about the human condition, which isn't, doesn't occur to me as true. Like if I say something nice to somebody, I feel nice. If I say something nice to nobody, I feel nice. If I say something mean to nobody, I feel bad. You know, like this idea of altruism has this weird assumption that you're over there and I'm over here rather than that we're all part of some being, right? And so I'm not sure I agree with that. I think an interesting question is her about heroism, right? Somebody mentioned people running into a burning fire. That's not altruism, that's heroism. An altruist isn't really risking anything, right? If I, if I give somebody $5 on the street or say a kind word or, you know, just help an old lady walk across the street or whatever. It's like, I haven't really risked anything, but if I go and I risk my life or I stand up for something that a lot of people don't believe in, I could lose my job. I think heroism is, is a lot more interesting than 
altruism. I, I agree with I, I agree with Gil that altruism is rampant because it feels good and because we're connected. But heroism is a lot more interesting to me. Um, and I think and then the other the other thing about both about altruism and the other question he asked about like how much are we seeking validation, as if there's something wrong with that. You know, like, what if I'm seeking validation all the time? Like, right now, I'm seeking validation. Let me scroll through. Is everybody smiling? And, oh, look, Klaus is smiling. And he's the, he's the, he's the host, so I, that's the best validation I could get. And, well, Doug always smiles. I don't know if that's validation. And, you know, like, as if there's something malfunctional about how our psyches work. And I don't, I don't ascribe to that. I think that if we're seeking attention or we're seeking what, like there's some reason that our psyches work the way they work. And uh, yeah, it's better to be aware of it, but I, like there's this implication, like maybe there's something wrong with something about us and, 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 and we all need to be more enlightened. And I'm not sure that I ascribe to that. That's me. I heard uh, someone say uh, uh, it's way back, and I can't attribute the comment, but it's, uh, it's he was saying that the world will be saved by reciprocal altruism, a system of reciprocity and altruism. Uh, you have to, because we do expect reciprocity in order to build trust, right, over, over time. Yeah, so yeah, that that seemed to because it, it, it altruism is also selfish in some way, right? I mean, you help others to help yourself. Well, that was Gene's point, I think. Yeah, that's what go, I thought he was saying. Yeah, and go I, ahead, Stacey. Um, no, just just quickly with that. erase this point. The problem with validation is when you're seeking validation and moving away from what you really want. So when you're doing something that is not what you would normally do specifically to seek validation. I think that's that's when it becomes a concern. Well, maybe, I mean, it depends. Like if your instinct is worse than what society would have you do, then maybe validation's good. We just live in a society where what our society considers good might not be so great. So, because it's got to be functional, right? It's got to be functional. Otherwise, it wouldn't have survived evolution. Right, but I think, I think that need for validation, I mean, I'm speaking for myself now, the need from validation for validation, I think, is rooted in fear and lack of safety. That's not a good thing. <laughs> I would like to be able to feel safe without getting validation from other people. That, that's what I would like to grow towards. Yeah, I think the answer to that question may be very personal, depending on what you're working on in your own personal life. Right, but if it's if if this is a phenomena, and people are changing their positions based on how safe they feel in a group, that's why we have bullies leading large groups. <laughs> I mean, I'm I, I'm not you know picking on anybody, but that's how we would get a Trump situation. That's yeah, how yeah, we yeah. would get a Trump situation in a malfunctioning society. But in a functioning society, seeking validation could be good. Again, if we give the, the example of synagogue, you know, like there's certain things that you do because that's the behavior that's expected of you. And that's, you need, you know, you want to do your share of the cleaning up after the meal and you're seeking validation. It's just in a malfunctional society, validation is malfunctional. In a functional society, validation is useful and there's a right balance between um, not having the confidence to do what you believe in and doing what's acceptable. Like, I just think these things are in balance. They're not hundred percent bad or hundred percent good. Yeah, they'll find yeah. balance. I agree. Yeah, but I, I would still reintroduce this idea of reciprocity uh, you know, because it goes back into our evolutionary past. I mean, just the dawn of everything, our discussion around that you know, is very much based on we, we anticipate reciprocity because that's the way that we're wired and that's the way our society functions. Gail, you, know, you have your hand up. Where is Gail? Gail, you're on mute. I did get my hand down, but I didn't do that. Um, 
Uh, yeah, reciprocity is explored uh, gorgeously in the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I deep, strongly encourage people to have a look at that if you're not familiar with it. Um, um, you know, it's not just in synagogue, it's in relationships, it's in marriages, it's in families. So we have, you know, we have expectations of each other. There, there are social norms and cultural norms, and sometimes they're misunderstood um, by different people in a, in, a, in a collection. So it gets messy there, uh, but that's there. I just want to flag what Grace said a, a while ago, because I think it's really at the heart of some of this conversation is, you know, is do we live as though we are separate beings? Or do we live as if we're one? Uh, the way that I've been exploring it lately is what might it be like if we lived as though we belonged to the living world? Uh, which is very different than environmental care and management. And what might it be like if, if we lived as though we belonged to each other? Which we you know sort of approach sometimes in families and maybe sometimes in other larger networks. Uh, but, um, you know, so I, I just, I, I love that Grace raised that. I want, didn't want that to slip by. I think it's a fundamental question behind pretty much everything we're talking about in every one of these schools. Yeah, thank you. Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was reacting to something you said, Klaus, um, about, you know, there being, you know, some reward that the altruist gets. And, and certainly, um that can be that can be and then and, and certainly that happens a lot i also believe there's the possibility and the reality of doing something without a reward um i as a software developer and designer um have encountered many systems that try to algorithmically implement values, whether it's a reputation system or, um, you know, a friend of a friend uh, kind of networking to kind of say, oh, you might like that person because they like chicken. And you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of overlay of a, as I try to put it, a um, discrete system across a analog system. You know, we are human beings. We have values. We are sometimes able or unable to express what we value and to ask for what we value um, or to know what we want. <laughs> it's so often that I have no clue in a relationship what's possible. I mean, it takes this interaction that's human that I see we want to have automated in some way. And it's that desire to have computers do the work of making friends for us. That's something I don't trust yet. <laughs> I'm not sure if I ever will trust that from a kind of a a foundational principle perspective. Um, I'm glad that this conversation is happening. That's sort of my frame for, you know, when we talk about online communication and how to develop and design um, communities. Um, I've certainly met people and, and kept, uh, I met somebody at Flower Piano at, uh, uh, in San Francisco a um, couple of weekends ago, and she basically designs communities. And uh, I'm trying to invite her to this um, group. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think the, the point before I got a little bit on a ramble was, I really do believe that humans are so diverse. And I love this term, the imp of the perverse, where you take a perverse view of you have to act this way and you go, no, I'm not. I don't. You have to believe this way. You have to feel this way. You have to have this value. And it's in the vast diversity of humans to say, uh-uh, I'm going to just do this for the hell of it. I am going to give 10 bucks 
to the guy who's sleeping on the street. I'm going to slip $100 under his blanket. I'm going to give him dental floss. Um, I'm just going to you know, have fun with being nice and not have any expectation whatsoever. Yeah, Mark, the, the, my, my uh, perception of reciprocal altruism wasn't to look for reward, but I look at it as an evolutionary survival tool. Right. So it's a completely uh, different uh, thing. So it is selfish because I want to survive. I want to be around people who uh, I can trust will protect me if that if it comes to that. So from that, so it, yeah. What I, what I know and I study about evolution is that evolution is incredibly complex. We cannot look at evolution as an optimization engine. It's a satisficing engine. There are things that evolution produces that survive that are vestigial, that don't have any purpose anymore, and they survive because it takes too much work to remove them, to remove the appendix from the human genome. It's, it's not going to happen. It's not harming anything. It's not keeping, you know, it's not producing or reducing evolutionary fitness. It happened. It is in the historical path of evolution, um, but it's not useful. And there are many things in social evolution, technological evolution, biological evolution that just appear. And we cannot give functional ascription to those, to those things. And so I think it's more complicated than that. I'm not sure that, um, for example, we can't do something like universal human income and climate change at the same time. And, you know, everybody won't be, you know, having this moral danger of, you know, turning into you know, couch potatoes in front of the TV. I mean, there's the, these are the kinds of evolutionary arguments that are made, or there are, evolutionary arguments, evolutionary <laughs> theory-based arguments, but I think they're often much more complicated than they're used. And I'm not singling out what you said, Klaus, but that I think, you know, you have a really interesting point, and I think it's uh, something that could be explored a lot deeper, and I don't agree with it automatically. Thanks for listening. Yeah, no, totally. I, I, I think the difficulty we have to, 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 even, to even accept this concept is that we are so separated, right? I mean, if you are living within a, a closed community, then this whole concept of, of reciprocity, uh, uh, reciprocal uh, altruism is easily understood because you're creating trust you now, basically. Now we're living, you know, eight billion people. We're communicating uh, in in abstract ways, so that uh, that concept is is in my mind as vital and important today as it ever was. But it's just not obvious you know, to to us, and it's so easy to violate because all the the anonymity that we have in our society. So. You know, Stacy, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, to Mark's point about, you know, not wanting an algorithm to, you know, suggest friends based on the fact that they all like chickens. I agree. But um, what was I going to say? So when I had said earlier, if there was something that said, are you sure you want to send that remark? I'd be interested in being matched up with people that remove their comments after thinking about it. That would be a quality that for me would, would indicate somebody that I would want to communicate with and be friends with. So most of the friends on my Facebook page, I have many different views. I mean, there are people from all walks of life that are friends with me. But the one thing in common is that I've always found a way to have some sort of respectful conversation. And they've always been open to it. Even if it maybe started you know, a little rough, I was always able to get them to where we could have some civility. To me, that's that's a key factor. 
Yeah. Thank you, Stacey. Um, we're almost out of time, but Doug, Doug Carmichael, uh, we have you on the list next. Would you uh, would you like to give us your comments here? And you're muted. No, I, uh, I personally find this a uh, not a terribly engaging conversation, and I don't know quite why. Yeah. Can take a, could you take a shot, Doug? Well, it seems to me that if we, uh, in the long range of history, that we spend our time this way rather than coping with the issues of society and the economy and history, will look strange. There's a brilliant book by Tom Standage called Writing on the Wall, 2,500 Years of Social Media. And he goes all the way back to the graffiti on the walls of Pompeii and talks about how that was a way that people shared information and even built community. People would sort of walk by the same wall and add things. But he spends a lot of time on the coffee shops and the... Uh, and the letters written by the scholars in the 1800s and 1700s and, and how you know, these new paradigms of community building changed history. And I, I could believe that what we've started is changing history. And clearly, you know, the, the fact that Bill Clinton used the web in 1996 to get reelected, Barack Obama used a uh, meetup to beat Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump weaponized Twitter. I mean, we've already seen three cases of these technologies changing history, or at least American history, which often changes world history. So I, I maybe I'm a technological optimist. Maybe I'm a, I, because I'm so close to it, I, I tend to overemphasize what we're doing, but I, I, uh, particularly given that we're only 10% of the way through the internet revolution. I, I, I think this is, there's something really important going on here. I, what we don't have is a good, good answer to all the questions that we've posed. Yeah. But thank you for, for being the skeptic. We need, we need that. Yeah. Back to your... let, let me say what's on my mind instead, and I'll try and keep it very short. What if human beings in their interactions with each other weave a network that becomes increasingly tight and as it expands across the globe, we get to the point where the, the weaving is so tight that actually nothing can happen. And we've built ourselves into a spiderweb trap uh, that prevents action, and we just crash. Now, my thinking is that that might be uh, human nature. There's no way out of it. Human beings, by being inventive and relational, are going to weave themselves into a structure which becomes impervious to change. That is known in Heidegger's term as the inframing, where you know we define language so carefully that we can only use it in this again discrete way and not an analog way. I'm not sure that that that's gonna that, that's human nature, Doug. I think I think uh, we're always, um, you know, my friend who was a. Uh, his parents were hippies, he became a marine sniper, you know, <laughs> as the generations change, um, I, I think, you know, I, I trust, I trust, uh, I trust eight-year-olds to be different from me. What, what was Heidegger's term again? The inframing. E-N or yes, I-N? E-N, e e framing. Thank you. Yeah, I would have, uh, uh, I, I, I would have loved to insert a question about have you seen change in conversations over the last few months, you know, and has there been some sense of uh, urgency? Um, are people uh, becoming alert to the environmental um, 
discussions that are taking place politically, environmentally, and so on. So we didn't make it to that to that question. But um, that one, Klaus, depends entirely on where you hang out. Because if I hang out here, I hear very different conversations than if I hang out on Fox News. Yeah, no, I didn't mean Fox News. I mean conversations. I don't mean uh, the media. I, I mean oh, in, no, but in the, the but the people who watch Fox News have conversations, and there are conversations at school boards and Proud Boy meetings and Republican, you know, election campaigns and you know supermarkets and so forth. There's conversations all the way every time, but they're influenced by different constellations of. You know, I, I, I hear, but I wanted to really personalize this. So, so for me, for example, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, well, I don't spend much time on Facebook anymore, but I'm you know, in the leadership team for the Sierra Club, Citizen Climate Lobby, Business Climate. So I'm in a bunch of groups. And I can see people starting to become more alert, uh, dialing in uh, more intensely to wanting to know what is uh, uh, happening around them in a sense that it may impact them personally. So, so I was just wondering if that is reflected in the group, uh, in your own personal conversations with your own personal networks. And we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> But no, just to, uh, because uh, I, I think it would be important to dial in, right? Uh, because to Doug's point, we're really in bad shape. I mean, this is, uh, you, you know, it's what I'm working on, dealing with all the time. We're in horrible shape. And 2023 will be a very rough year uh, as it is shaping up. Uh, and I'm thinking about this in terms of food supply and, and you know, basic needs and, the Europeans you now looking at uh, having massive migrations uh, uh, they're facing and so on. So, yeah, I think that's what Doug was referring to. You know, the we we are really, but but you know, I think the convers I like the conversation a lot because um, we we have we, we're social animals and then we are communicating through our social networks in social terms. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's the urgency really at the level that it needs to be. I think that was Doug's question. Is that fair, Doug? Yes. Yeah. So with that, thank you so much. It was a great call. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thanks for hosting. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.